Welcome to Film Literature. Yes, this is the course where we will watch a lot of movies, but I hope that we can treat film as a kind of literature. So it's not just uh, you come here and you have fun for three hours and then you go home. Um, but I hope that we can take each film as something to think about, something to talk about, and hopefully something we can learn from. Film, like all literature, is a kind of communication. The artist created this work to try to tell you something. Maybe it's an idea. Maybe it's a feeling. Maybe it's both. Um, but I hope that um, we can view these films not just as entertainment, not just thinking about is it a good film or a bad film, but we can think about what is the artist trying to give to us? And how does the artist do that? So uh, let's jump into the course introduction. I love this new table. Look at this. OK, so uh, this course is designed so that everything you need is on Moodle, except for the movies. Uh, you have to come here to watch the movies. But after uh, we watch each movie, I will upload it to this folder and you can download the movie if you miss it in class or if you want to watch it again. OK, let's see what we're doing. Week one, introduction to the course. I'm doing that now. Introduction to films. I will talk about that a bit later. And introduction to filmmaking. Uh, I have a handout for you. I will pass that out later when we begin the discussion. Next week, or the, the following three weeks, each week will focus on one stage of film production, making a movie. So week two will be on pre-production. What do filmmakers do before they actually pick up a camera? Week three will be production, which is using a camera to capture the images. And week four will be post-production. What do filmmakers do after they have all of the images? For each week, we will watch a movie uh, about that stage. So next week, we're going to watch the film State in Maine, which is about uh, a camera or a film crew before they start shooting. Week three, we're going to watch the classic movie Day for Night, directed by um, uh, Francois Truffaut. And this will be the only non-English language film in our class. We're an applied English department. I, I should try to play all English movies, but there really is no movie quite like Day for Night. Trust me, I've searched for an entire year and a half. Nothing as good as this movie. It's also kind of old, 1973. So uh, the process of filmmaking that it shows may not be exactly how filmmakers make movies today. To correct for that, sorry. To correct for that, week four, we're going to watch a documentary called Side by Side. This documentary introduces changes uh, due to the digital revolution in filmmaking. So using digital cameras, digital editing, a digital technology, and how that has changed filmmaking. Uh, so that will be the post-production part. Now, starting on week five, you will notice that basically every week says film and discussion. So here's the thing. Um, it, this is a three hour course. The first two hours, we will watch a movie. 
the third hour, uh, you will do some group discussions. So um, in a couple weeks, I think uh, on week four, I will divide you into small groups. Not that small. It's going to be pretty big. We have a lot of people. Uh, and so starting week five, after we watch a film, um, the reason I don't tell you what the film is, is because I have not seen these films either. This will be an entirely new experience. We're all going to watch these films together for the first time. Um, and after the film ends, there will be a 10 minute break. During that break, I will write the discussion questions and I will post them on Moodle. Uh, so the questions will be hot off the press, brand new questions. And then uh, you guys can spend some time talking about those questions. Um, so that's week five, week six. Week seven doesn't have a discussion because week seven is going to be a three hour film. Um, and so the discussion will be moved to week eight. And um, after we finish discussing the long film, I will spend the rest of week eight's class introducing the midterm exam. The midterm exam, uh, I will show you, I will give you a short film and you will have to write an essay question uh, in response to that film. Sunlunti. So week nine midterm exam, uh, it will be online. You will have one week to do the exam, so there's no class. And then we do the same thing for the second half of the semester. Um, week 13 film 10 will be a horror film, and I, I mentioned this specifically because I know some people don't like horror. I also don't like horror a lot, um, but it's uh, an important kind of film that we should talk about. So this is just to give you a bit of uh, mental preparation. Week 14, we can either watch the movie I chose, or you guys can recommend a movie. Throughout the semester, if you think that uh, you want uh, everybody to watch a movie together. You can mention the movie to me and I will consider it. Basically, the movie has to, uh, if it's under two hours, I will put it on week 14. If it's under three hours, I will put it on week 15. Um, it can't be like porn, right? It can't be like too extreme because we're still in, in class. Um, I have to be able to find it online somewhere. And I also have to be able to find Chinese subtitles. I'm sure you guys want Chinese subtitles. But other than that, uh, I'm open to watching any kind of movie. So if you have a movie that you want to share with everyone, uh, you can mention that to me during the semester. Um, and I will protect your identity. Just in case it's a terrible movie, I won't let your classmates know it was you who recommended it. Now, week 17 is a final project. The final project is you in your small groups have to make a short film. Uh, short means under 15 minutes. That sounds OK, right? But if you've ever tried to make a movie, you'll know that Every second takes effort. Um, so week 16, uh, again, week 15 will be a long movie. Week 16 will discuss that long movie. And the rest of that week, I will give to your groups to make final preparations for your short film. And I will explain about the project a bit more later. Week 18, final exam week, so there's no class, there's no exam. The final project is your exam. Notice the grading. This is very important. Midterm exam, 40%. Final project, 40%. Participation, 
So, you know, don't fuck up your exam. That would be really bad for your grade. Uh, and a brief reminder here. The final project will take more time than you anticipate. No, even more time than that. Uh, there's a rule of law in psychology that something will take more time than you think, even when you know that it will take more time than you think. So you really do have to start working on this as soon as I divide you into small groups. Otherwise, you won't have time. OK, do you have questions about the schedule? No, OK, um, I will tell you that the movies I have chosen include old movies, new movies, color movies, black and white movies, um, action movies, romance, just like a lot of different stuff. Um, I did not choose them randomly. These are all movies that um, have been recommended. Some of them are classics. Some of them are new. Um, I just haven't had the time to watch them yet, so I thought, you know, why not watch them together? Kill two birds with one stone. Um, there are also like do uh, no, no, no documentaries, um, an animated movie. There's there's an animated movie in there too. OK, so let's look at the Moodle page. If you need to reach me, write me here. This is my email. Uh, the syllabus, we just looked at that. Class emails. If I have to make an announcement and send an email to your student uh, email, there will be a record of that message here. So if you didn't get the message, uh, you can come and check here. At the beginning of today, I mentioned that film is a kind of literature. So why do we have to study literature? Shouldn't literature be something that we can either enjoy or choose to not enjoy? Why do we have to spend time in class talking about it? You know, I think that there's uh, everything under the sun has its own kind of expertise. You can enjoy something or you can be really good at something or you can truly understand something. And literature is also like this. So like what what are some benefits of learning literature? Um, this is a paper in Chinese about uh, some benefits. You get things like uh, improving your English, improving communication skills, improving empathy. Uh, apparently, I don't really believe that, but some people believe that. Um, to me, I think the, the greatest value in, in learning about literature is that good literature is a reflection of life. So you can learn more about life than simply your own life. You guys are, you know, like somewhere between 18 and 22, something like that, right? Most of you. Assuming that everybody lives to like 90 years old, you are not yet one fifth, you are not yet one fourth somewhere between one fourth and one fifth of your whole life. But uh, if you are willing to engage in works of literature and to read or experience other people's lives, you get more out of your one life uh, when you are able to look at other people's lives as well. And literature has another advantage over things like um, the news, nonfiction, biography, which is that um, if a work is based on fact, there are certain limits. You can't say something that's false. You can't tell a lie. But with literature, there are no limits. So it's not just an exploration of a person's actual life. It's also an exploration of a person's inner life interior subjective experience, not just what happens, but how do they feel about it? How do they make sense of it? Um, and I truly think that the the most um, meaningful thing we can do in life is try to understand other people's experiences. 
Now that's literature. Uh, and if you want to uh, read more about that, you can check out this paper in Chinese. But with film specifically, there is another reason why it's important to examine and look closely at films. Visual media, Sidremeti, are the most important kind of media in today's society. Not many people read books anymore, but everybody watches some kind of video. So it's important to be able to think about what exactly is a, a particular video telling you. There is a surface level. The, the artist or creator makes the video to try to do something. But there's also a level underneath. What kind of culture and background is the creator from? What kind of values does the creator unintentionally convey and express? For example, uh, you guys have seen Iron Man, right? I think I think all of you have seen Iron Man. Or most of you, or maybe that's already too old. OK, how about the first Black Panther? Most of you have seen that, right? Did you notice that uh, the only white guy played by Martin Short is a member of the CIA? In other words, when the US tries to support a friendly country, they use the CIA as a kind of foreign intelligence agency. They don't send in the regular army. They don't work with allies. They send a secret agent. At the same time, uh, the CIA throughout history has also done some very terrible stuff. If you don't know, the CIA was behind so many right wing revolutions in Latin America, South America, Africa. Uh, and of course, the CIA um, also supported Chiang Kai-shek as well. So in Black Panther, by treating the CIA agent as a good guy, it is pre presenting this image to you that when the Americans want to help, anybody they send is a good guy. And it totally ignores the possibility that someone from the CIA might actually be a bad guy. And throughout history, uh, that CIA agents have more often been bad guys than good guys. That's not something the movie is trying to tell you, but because the, the filmmakers and creators come from that kind of culture where America sees itself as the good guy, that kind of value is conveyed through the design of the film unintentionally. So that's just one of the ways that examining visual media uh, can help us see more clearly what exactly these works are trying to tell us intentionally or unintentionally. OK, the next thing is uh, um, the handout. So if you forget the handout, uh, you can find it online. The next thing is a link to a OneDrive folder. This is where I will put the films after we watch them. Um, now, do you guys know how to add subtitles to a movie file? Last time I taught this course, some people did not know how to do this. So here I have a link to a video that I made uh, about how you can add subtitles to a movie file. This is important because the midterm will also be a movie file with subtitles that you have to add yourself. So I encourage you to practice doing this at home to make sure you know how to do it. Uh, and if by the time of midterm week you still don't know how to do this, you really should try to learn. OK, next I'm teaching this course in English and Every week's uh, if there is a lecture, I will record the lecture part. So like after the 
group discussions, I will like ask for your ideas and then like tie everything together. That is a lecture. I will record that part and I will upload it to Moodle and then uh, sorry, upload it to YouTube and I will post a link to Moodle. Um, the reason I do this instead of just leaving the video on Teams or uploading it directly to Moodle is because if I upload it to YouTube, you can search through the video. YouTube will generate a transcript, uh, so a record of everything I say, and you can open the transcript and do a text search. You can search for specific words that I say. And by clicking on those words, it can take you to that part of the video. So if you need to find something, uh, for example, when you're preparing for the midterm exam, you don't have to waste your time watching the whole video. You can search for it and jump there. So this uh, YouTube video that I created shows you how to do that. Uh, this is where I will input your participation grades. This is currently hidden. Speaking of grades, well, I'll get to that later. Sorry, I'll get to that later. OK, and then this middle section will have two things. The first thing, as you can already see, is um, sorry, the first thing will be the discussion questions that I write during the break. I will post them here. The second thing you can already see. Um, my personal habit or hobby is I like to read about films after I watch them. I'm also a Rotten Tomatoes film critic under the name CJ Shu. Uh, so each week after we watch a movie, if I find something online that I think is a good um, review or a good exploration of the movie, I will post a PDF here. You don't have to read it if you don't want to, but if you do uh, want to learn more about movies and how to watch movies, um, give you some new ideas. These are some things that you can consider. Now, because this is not required reading, I don't really care about how hard each essay is. I'm simply picking what I think is the best essay. Okay, the next section is for the midterm exam. I will explain this in more detail on week eight, but the idea is uh, I will give you a short film to watch, watch the film, and then there will be one essay question that you have to answer. And these are the specific rules you have to follow. Basically, use English, don't copy, and give me evidence. Evidence includes a specific timestamp, or sorry, approximate timestamp. If you don't give me a timestamp, I will take away part of your grade. Um, this is every time I teach a literature class, I tell students in your exam, give me a page number, a line number, a timestamp. Very few people do. Um, and so this time I decided that you have to. If you don't, I will take away points. Um, why shouldn't you copy? Here is an article in Chinese to explain the history of plagiarism. Uh, it basically, though, if you do plagiarize your exam, any part of your exam, it doesn't have to be entirely copied. If you copy any part of your exam and I can find the source, then you get a zero on this exam. Remember, the exam is worth 40% of your final grade. So if you copy off like the Internet. In English or Chinese. Or Japanese, I once caught a Japanese a source. Um, you probably won't pass the course. So, you know, don't do that. Uh, some of you may not have experience answering midterm, uh, sorry, answering essay questions. So I include here example answers to other essay questions. These are answers to questions that are not the midterm exam question. But I think that these answers do a good job of giving an answer and including evidence in the answer. So you can take a look at these. A few of them I wrote myself. 
And then finally, the midterm exam it will will be open April 6th after class. Next section is the final project. Uh, the short film can be in English or Chinese. Or both, but it must have both English and Chinese subtitles. Um, I'm not going to care too much about your English grammar, right? As long as people can understand what you're trying to say. Um, and so on week 17, each group will come. Uh, you have to upload your movie to YouTube. And on week 17, each group will show the movie and answer some questions. Now the grade will be given by me, but also by your fellow students and your fellow group members through peer review, Tong Tai Ho Ping. So you will give a grade to your group members based on how much they contributed to the final project. Basically, everybody should get a score, but you can give somebody a zero if they did absolutely nothing. If they didn't even show up, you will also give a grade to the final project of the other groups. And um, so you will fill that out here, the peer review sheet. And you'll have to upload it the same night. As week 17. Uh, upload it here, and this is also where I will give you the grade for the final project. I'll go into more detail on week 16, I think. No, I'll go into more detail on week four. OK, and then we have this last part here. If you think you are going to fail this course, here's a way to save yourself. Um, I'm not going to adjust final scores. In the past, you may or may not have noticed that as long as your final score was 50, I let you pass. Not this time. If you think your final score will not be 60, if it will be below 60, um, I'm not going to give you uh, extra points unless you do this um, bonus assignment. Now, the flip side of this is um, it's not an easy assignment. I don't want to make this an easy way to pass the course. The, the course itself is already easy to pass. So uh, please don't think that you can be lazy and don't do any of the work and then just do this and then pass. You will find that this assignment is harder than the midterm exam. So this really is only an option of last resort. If you think you might fail, here's how to save yourself. So you can take a look at this uh, in your own time. Now, how do you know if you're going to fail? Here. I have opened the grades up for you to examine. You can see your own grades. Um, basically, it's just midterm, final, and uh, participation. If you click grades uh, on Moodle, I use a uh, simple addition. So the highest score for your midterm will be 40. The highest score for your final project will be 40 and your participation score. The highest will be 20. So you just add everything together. That will be your final score. I think that's it, right? OK, do you have questions about everything on the Moodle page? OK, um, let's pass out the handouts.
Anyone need one? Anyone not need one? Okay. How oh, cool the microphone can pick up my voice. Let's say that a film is a work of literature. And that a work of literature is an act of communication between the creator and the receiver, in this case, the viewer. There are a number of tools that each work of literature or work of art gives its creator to use to communicate. We can look at these tools from two directions. If we're going to do both directions. From the perspective of the viewer and the perspective of the filmmaker. The handout is from the perspective of the filmmaker. But first, let's think about the viewer. Everything in a film is the result of a decision. When you pick up your can your phone and you take a picture, you already are deciding that this thing is worth taking a picture of, that the background is okay, that the colors are and the lighting is okay. So even though it's something that you find in the world, you make the decision to accept all that you find when you take a picture. And the same goes for movies. When you see an image on screen, basic questions, what do you see? Is there a person? If there is a person, what do they, uh, who are they? What do they look like? What does their hair look like? What does their face and makeup look like? What are they wearing? Where are they looking? Where are they facing? Is there another person? Are they interacting? Are they ignoring each other? What is the relationship of space between the two people or between the person and the environment? What is in the background? Is it indoors? Is it outdoors? Is it real or is it digital? Are there artificial things or is it in nature? What kind of nature? Plants, animals, growing, dying, healthy, sick? What's the weather like if it's outdoors? Sunny, cloudy, raining, foggy, in the dark of night? Where is the light coming from? If it's indoors, is it coming from the ceiling? Is it coming from somewhere in the room? Is there a window? Is there a door? If it's outdoors, where's the sun? If it's at night, where's the light? If there's no light, how do we see the image? All these questions are about what is in the image, but we can also talk about the image itself. What is the color? Has the color been adjusted? Is it darker or brighter? Is there more blue, more green, more brown, more yellow? How clear is the picture? Is there grain? Is it crystal clear? Is it blurry? Is it out of focus? And these are all one image. What about when an image starts moving? What is moving? Are the people moving? Are the objects moving? Are they moving in the same direction? Are they moving in opposite directions? 
Is it somewhere between movement and no movement, something you can't quite pick out? Is the image itself moving? Is the camera moving? If it's moving, does it move like this? Or does it move like this? Or does it move like this? Does it go up and down, left or right? In or out? Does the image begin in darkness and end in light? Are we moving from behind an obstacle or do we move into an obstacle? When we have to change scenes from one place to another, where does one scene stop and the next scene begin? What are we skipping in the middle? If it's in the same scene, and the image jumps, we call this a cut, when it cuts from one direction to another. What is the first direction? What is the second direction? Why are there two directions? What does each direction represent? Is there a specific perspective? A specific feeling? And these are all just images. What about the sound? Is there music? Is there sound effects? You know, when you're standing outside and you're taking a video, it's usually a terrible sound quality, right? The wind is blowing, people are shouting in the background, you can hear the bell. Why don't we hear that in a movie? What things do we hear in a movie? What things do we not hear that we expect to want to hear? Every answer to those questions is the result of a choice by the filmmakers. Now, in an ideal world, every choice would be exactly what the filmmaker wants. But making a movie, as you can tell from the handout, takes a lot of people, a lot of money, a lot of time. And people make mistakes. And sometimes the filmmaker themselves don't know exactly what they want until they see the images and try to put them together. So yes, everything in a movie is the result of a decision, but sometimes those decisions are limited. Sometimes you need to fix something that you can't really fix, and so you have to choose among a number of different imperfect options. That's also something we should remember when we watch these films. Yes, the final product is approved by the filmmakers. That doesn't mean it's exactly what the filmmakers want. It's simply what the filmmakers think is acceptable. So I know that that was a lot of questions. I hope you can keep some of those questions in mind when we watch the movies. Okay, let's look at the handout. Um, when you make a film, there are a number of different parts. Each part is called a department. Um, so, Let's start from the top, the director. Sometimes it's more than one director. Sometimes the director is not the most powerful person. But the director has two basic jobs. The second job is to make sure people do what they're supposed to be doing. The first job is to make sure that the movie feels like one movie. I'm sure you've all seen that kind of bad film where it seems like in this scene you're watching a comedy, in that scene you're watching a horror, and the whole thing doesn't really fit together. That is because the director did not do a good job. The director's most important job is to make the movie feel like one movie. Uh, and that also means that 
you know, in movies, just like in life, different things happen, but you have to try to make it all feel like it belongs to the same story. To help the director, the directing department has some assistant directors. Um, and so that's why this department is also sometimes called Video Village. The especially today when you use digital technology, Video Village is where the director sits and he looks at the monitor which records what the camera is recording or which presents what the camera is recording. So it's like a, a group of monitors and a group of people surrounding the director. So that's why it's called a video village. The assistant directors have their own specific jobs. The first assistant director helps manage the set. Um, I should mention that there are uh, vocabulary items um, somewhere. I remember there are vocabulary items. OK, the set is. Oh, I remember now. OK, here the set. The production location. This is where they shoot the movie. So the first assistant director helps manage the set. When the director is focused on one thing, the first AD has to take care of everything else on set. The second AD helps manage the cast when they are not acting. So when the actors are working, they're on set, but when they don't have to work on that scene, they go rest somewhere else. And it is the second AD's job to take care of the actors when they're not working. The third AD, sometimes called the second second assistant director, takes care of everybody when they are off the set. Usually people come from around the world in order to make a movie. So when they're not working, they have to stay at a hotel. The third AD is responsible for taking care of the people when they are at the hotel. Now, aside from people actually working, you also have people who help the director with ideas. Um, the most important people are called executive producers. Uh, these people offer guidance and support to the director, and also sometimes they just give you some money. Money is very important. You guys know how much it costs to make a, a film in the US? A budget of 1 million US dollars is a low budget movie. A budget of less than $500,000 is called a no budget movie. Making movies can be very expensive. So executive producers, uh, either they actually know about the themes of the movie and they give actual advice or they just give you money. Either way, they are very important. Sometimes the subject matter of the movie requires technical knowledge. Maybe you're making a movie about history. Maybe you're making a movie about space. You need experts to help you with that. Uh, and so these are the people that the director will ask for technical advice. Now, when we talk about the director's actual work, we usually talk about two main kinds of directing. Acting direction, this is when the director guides the actors. And camera direction, this is when the director decides how to use the camera. The camera is probably the most special part of making a movie in terms of literature. When you write a piece of literature, you have to care about the perspective, but you don't have to care too much. When the author says this character was thinking something, you don't really have to think, is that true? The author just told you that's what the character is doing. But in a movie, you can't do that. You can only look at somebody from the outside. So how do you use the camera to express interior thoughts and feelings? That is part of the director's vision. How the director thinks about using the camera. 
The next department is the production department. If the directing department makes all the decisions, the production department helps carry out those decisions. The head of the production department is the producer. The producer controls the money and the schedule. Again, very important. You need a lot of money to make a movie. The people who give you that money usually have some expectations, including that there, there is some kind of schedule so that they can prepare to sell the movie. The producer is the person who works with the studio and the director to make sure that the film is finished, doesn't use too much money, and is finished in time to sell the movie to an audience who is ready to pay for the movie. Beneath the producer, you have people who help the producer. Uh, depending on how big the movie is, you might have a line producer and below that the production manager and below that you have associate producers and below that you have production assistants. So like when they make a Marvel movie, they have a large number of these people. But if you make a $500,000 no budget independent movie, you probably only need one line producer and like two production assistants. So it depends on how many people you really need to get the job done. The next one, production designer. This is the person who designs the setting, the background, the environment that you see in the movie. When people are acting indoors, everything behind the actor is designed. Either the designer bought an object for the background or the designer uh, hired people to make those objects to build the building and the walls um, in order to, to be in the movie. Uh, now today, a lot of movies use digital backgrounds. Those backgrounds also have to be designed, even if they aren't actually built. The next one, location manager. If the movie is uh, shot outdoors, then the location manager is the person who works to get the rights to shoot in that place. Like, uh, you know how lots of movies are shot in the middle of a city? That means that they have to close off the roads, close off traffic. If there are businesses on that street, they have to pay the business owners for their time. Because if you close off the roads, they can't have customers. If you shoot on private land, you have to ask the landowner for permission. If you want to change the look of outdoor environments, you also have to get the permission of the owners. So if you're shooting at a building and you want to change the color of the building to actually paint the building a different color, you have to ask the owner of the building for permission. So that's the lo location manager's job. Um, and the rest of these people do the actual physical work. Grips move things. Gaffers work with electricity like lighting and energy. Heating, cooling, and then you have caterers for food, drivers, medics or doctors and other necessary people. Uh, let's take a short break and we'll continue with the handout after that.
Okay. You have to, there's a there's a minimum publication requirement. Every year you have to publish a certain number of reviews and they have to be edited by somebody else um, and they have to be of a certain quality. They will check them. It took me like four years to get there. Four years? Yeah. It helps that I'm not from the U.S. They always, they're always looking for different perspectives around the world. If you're looking for a Marvel movie, the last Marvel movie I reviewed was um, the first Tom Holland Spider Man. You get a tie No, no, you don't like it. No, that's why I stopped watching Marvel movies. I called it that You know, it was one of the best movies from Marvel at the time, right? So I'm thinking if that's the best you can do, why am I wasting my time? Oh, that's a... <laughs> well, I, I think the first compliment Spider-Man is not, not so bad, it's decent. Yeah, exactly, right? Decent. 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 <laughs> not good enough. Good. Don't worry, I won't look at your final project for some more. I don't see anything. You have to uh, wait, go to the go to the right. Right. It says that you go to the right. Oh. Uh, okay, that's right. Yeah, you move. I don't know. Oh. Yeah, so you can click the read more. But it doesn't show up the, the Spider Man. You have to go really far back. That's what was Spider Homecoming, yes, Spider Man Homecoming. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How about the third one? Watch it. It's here. So, the Marvel movie after that, you know. The last one I saw was um, um, Endgame. Yeah. This one, many people choose to. Where they were the also stopped. Yeah, yeah. 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 The, only, the only movie I I think is good after that is Black Panther 2. Uh, but uh, it's not a lot of people don't like it. Because people say that it's more too sensitive. correct? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I just don't know why it's. There's a lot of black people, and then people just say that it's a sensitive issue. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can see both sides, right? On the one hand, it's Wakanda, uh, it's in Africa, of course they're all black. Yeah, of course. But on the other hand, why doesn't Marvel have more black people in the other place? I can think of Tessa Thompson, Samuel L. Jackson, and uh, who, who's the, the other Iron Man? Don Cheadle, Don Cheadle, yeah. And uh, I think there's one more, but that's it. Yeah, but, but in the U.S. Uh, Not true. In the latest comics, a lot of characters have turned black. Really? Yeah. The comics have always been politically more progressive than the movies. Oh.
Okay, so uh, we were talking about the production department. Caterers provide the food. You have lots of people, they need to eat. Drivers move people from the hotel to the set, from the set to the other set. Medics are there in case of emergencies. And today you also have COVID-19 medics to make sure everybody is keeping a safe distance, wearing a mask, these kinds of things. And then you have many, many other kinds of people. Some vocabulary that you might need. Production is when they actually make the movie, capture the images. Um, 
on the set is where they do the production. So you have on set and off the set. If they're shooting indoors, it's usually a sound stage. So it's like a huge empty space where they can build the environment. If it's outdoors, if the environment is entirely fake, it's called a studio lot in turn. If it's a real place, maybe they change something, but the place is real. It's called a location. And so if you're shooting on a location, you are on location. This just means you're outdoors in a place. Next, we have the acting department. These, of course, are the actors, but there's a lot of things we can talk about here also. So first of all, how do you choose the actors? Well, usually the director or the producer will have some ideas for the most famous actors. But there are a lot of people in movies, background actors, extras, supporting actors. To choose these people, usually you will have a casting director. The word cast just means the actors. So if you cast someone, you choose that person to be an actor in your movie. So the casting director works with the director to choose these other actors. Uh, collectively, together, the actors are called the cast. In Chinese, we call this cast. Uh, you have hair and makeup designers to work with the director to help the actors embody their characters. What kind of look would their characters choose in daily life? Uh, so re related to the body is hair and makeup. Related to clothing is costume and wardrobe. Even when you're shooting a movie in today and you have ordinary people, you still have to choose what kind of clothing they wear. Even if it's casual clothing, what is the color? What kind of brand? How expensive should it look? So you have uh, people who help with this stuff. So costume and wardrobe designers can either buy clothing if it exists, or they can get people to make the clothing. And then you have people who help the actors. If the character is from a different part of the world, you would have a dialect coach to help the actor say the lines in the dialect of the region of the world they're supposed to be. So dialect is Changdiao. You have stand-ins. You, you would hire people who look like the actors because when you make a movie, most of your time will be as an actor will be spent waiting. You're waiting for the lighting to be correct. You're waiting for the weather. You're waiting for people to be ready. The actual acting is very fast. So in order to save your time, especially if you're a very famous actor, the filmmakers will hire somebody who looks like you so that they can stand there uh, to, so that the lighting, uh, they will know what the lighting looks like. They will know what the scene will look like. And then when everything is ready, the actual actor comes in to do the scene. Uh, you will also have stand-ins when there's nudity, right? Or when there are uh, dangerous actions. We will talk about that later. And other necessary people. Usually these people follow the actor. The actor will have a manager, will have an assistant, um, will have like a support group of friends and family. We'll have an agent, these kinds of people. When we talk about acting, there are a few words we should know. Um, a line is one line of the script as spoken by an actor. When you read a script, there are many different ways that you can read a script. Uh, for example, the sentence, I didn't do it, he did. You can say, I didn't do it, he did. You can say, I didn't do it, he did. I didn't do it, he did. 
There are many different ways. So uh, each way is an interpretation, and each interpretation is called a line delivery, or the verb is to deliver a line. This is how the actor interprets that line when they are speaking it. Uh, and their interpretation itself is called a choice. They made a choice to do this kind of delivery. Uh, and the choice is related to the character. Why would this character do this in this way? That is an acting choice. Um, and then you can also talk about different kinds of acting. Here we have two basic kinds. Voice acting. How does the actor convey the character using their voice? What they say, what they sound like. And the other side of that is physical acting. How does the actor use their body to convey the character? Um, different characters or different kinds of people will move in different ways. So how does the actor uh, use their body to show character? The next department is cinematography. Everything related to the image, the creation of that image. Um, and the head of this department is called the director of photography. I think in Chinese we call this. So the job of the DP is to work with the director to take the director's ideas and turn them into images. The director will have some thoughts. Very few people start their career as directors. Most of them uh, work in a different department first. So every director will have their strengths and their weaknesses. Like a director who started out as an actor may not know much about cameras. A director who started out as a producer may not know much about acting. Some directors start out from cinematography and they know a lot about cameras. Anyway, the head of each department has to work with the director uh, to help where the director needs help. So that's the job of the DP to grab the director's ideas, turn them into images, and to make sure that the images turn out exactly how they are supposed to. So who works in this department? Of course, you have camera operators, the people who handle the cameras. Um, and you also have lighting technicians. The DP will come in and say, OK, the, the camera should be here. It should move like this. The light should come from here, here and here. It needs to be this color and that color. And the lighting technicians will work with the gaffers to string the electricity over, hook up the lights, add the color, make sure everything's perfect. Um, they are the people who actually move the lights. The next person is the focus puller. You may not have thought of this before. Focus is jiao dian. When you pull out your phone and you take a picture, the phone will grab the focus for you. It's automatic. But a professional movie camera will not. Because sometimes the director wants the image to be out of focus. So the focus puller is responsible for measuring the length between the camera and the main subject of the image. That way the director and the DP can decide, do we want this to be exactly in focus? Do we want it to be out of focus too close or out of focus too far? And you might be thinking, but everybody is moving. How can you tell the distance when everything is moving? And that's why preparing each scene takes so much time. You, you get the stand in to stand in the place and to, to walk the movements. And the focus puller has to make sure of the distance each time. Um, so you might have heard some filmmakers recently are making movies with their iPhones instead of a professional camera. 
But what the news doesn't tell you is that those are not iPhones you can buy. Those are iPhones that have been modified for specific uses. One of those modifications is to cancel out uh, to cancel out the autofocus. Okay, the next person, the colorist or color timer. This person is the person who controls the color of the entire image. When you watch a movie, sometimes you might think, wow, this movie looks pretty dark. You might think this movie looks pretty green or pretty blue. That is because of the color timer. Uh, it's not just like the color of the thing that you are uh, photographing. It's the color of the entire image. Um, but as we will see in week four, color timing today is can be very specific. You no longer have to change the entire image. The reason it's called a color timer is because back in the old days, in order to change the color, you had to take your roll of film and you had to dunk it in chemicals and you had to count how long in order to get what kind of color. So it's called a color timer. So those are the main people in the cinematography department. Um, some words that we should know related to the camera, the frame. When you look at a picture, the outside boundary of the picture is called the frame. Um, especially in movies, sometimes it is important to think about what is outside of the frame. What are we not seeing in this image? Um, so if something is in frame, it's inside the image. If it's outside the image, it's called it's out of frame. And then you have the three basic camera shots. A close up is when the camera is really close to the subject. A long shot is a camera that's very far from the subject and therefore a mid length shot is somewhere in between. And there are more specific words to describe how close or how far, like waist up, shoulder length, head shot. Um, but you only need to know the three basic uh, distances. OK, the next department is the editorial department. Basically, there's only two people in this department, the editor and the editorial assistant. The editorial assistant helps the editor, so I didn't include it on the handout. That's pretty obvious. The editor's job is to work with the director to put the images together to make the movie, the image part of the movie. So there are two basic ways to do this. There's selection. Every time they shoot a scene, there will be different angles and there will be different takes. An actor might try it once, try it twice, try it three times. The editor works with the director to choose which one of those to use. Sometimes they will take one shot from one take and another shot from another take. Uh, as long as it works when you put it together. The second part of the editor's job is to choose when to cut when to stop this scene or this shot. Uh, we all know the classic phrase, right? Lights, camera, action. Camera before action. The camera starts and then the actor starts acting, which means the camera will capture more than you need. So the editor chooses where do I cut? What can I take out? Some people say that editing is the heart of filmmaking, that editing is the one thing the other kinds of artwork cannot do. That's not true. Another artwork that uses editing is comics, manhua, right? You have different pictures and you have to think about how they are connected or not connected. But it is true that the editor's job is very unique. No other artwork has to decide when an image stops and another image begins. Um, so good editing usually involves logic and also rhythm. 节奏. 
Does this scene move too fast? Does it move too slow? That's the editing. Uh, some words we might need to know. A frame in filmmaking is a single image. Um, when you watch a movie, uh, like, or like if when you watch a movie that was shot on actual film, Jodren, uh, the speed of the images is played back at 24 frames per second. So every second that the movie is playing involves 24 frames of film. Some people claim that they can see the distinction between each frame, like Ang Lee, Li An. He says that he can see the black spaces between each picture. Nobody believes him. Because uh, 24 per second is way too fast. Um, some filmmakers have started going even faster. They have started using 60 frames per second. And the idea is that it makes it look much smoother. Um, but other people say that we don't want it to be so smooth. If it's too real, it it doesn't feel like a movie anymore. Um, so the classic speed is 24 per second. When you put all of the images together, that is called the footage. It's all of the images that you have. Um, sometimes this will be described in terms of how long uh, all of your film is when added together. So for like a really long movie, you might say somebody shot a thousand feet of footage. Um, so it's a way of talking about how long your film is. Um, and the next phrase, a take. A take is a part of the footage from when the camera starts to when the camera stops. Usually we use the word a take to talk about acting because usually uh, the person who cares the most is the actor. When the camera starts, they start acting. When the camera stops, they stop acting. But actually this has to do with editing more than acting. Um, and so uh, if the camera goes on for a long, long time, we call that a long take. In the past, because there was, it was using physical film, a long take could only be about 10 minutes. But now when we're using digital cameras, you can shoot a whole movie in one take. If you want to, not an easy thing to do. The next word, a shot. A shot is a take that has been put into the final film. So when we talk about a movie, we don't say this take, that take. We say this shot, that shot. If, you're, if you say take, you're thinking about all of the other times that the actor tried this shot. Or all of the different options that the editor had, and they ended with this shot instead of that take. Um, the next word, a cut, and the verb is to cut. This is when the editor in the old days took an actual pair of scissors and cut through the film to end uh, one shot. But at the same time, if it's not the end of the movie, there's going to be another shot after that. So the editor then has to take a different part of the film and stick those two parts of film together. So today when we talk about cuts, it's an ending, but it's also the beginning of the next part. That's why in Chinese we call this jin, jie, yo yo jin, yo yo jie. There are different kinds of cuts. Uh, I think the two most important kinds are a, oh, okay, so the, the basic kind of cut, you hope that there is some kind of connection between the first shot and the second shot. Maybe it's a, the same person. Maybe it's the same angle. Maybe there's something similar in the image of both shots. If there's absolutely no similarity, that's called a smash cut. It's like somebody running through the door. It's fast and it's sudden and it's supposed to shock you a little bit. Another kind of cut is uh, a 
plural fast cuts or fast cutting. This is when in a scene you have many different shots that move very quickly and are put together. So like in an action movie, right? When when some when there's fighting, when two a characters are fighting each other, usually those cuts are very, very fast. The next word is a scene. A scene is the part of the film that is centered on a single idea or event. You can think about this as a paragraph in an essay. Uh, so a number of shots put together about the same thing, we call that a scene. When you put together different scenes, oh, sorry, when you when you talk about the different shots inside that scene that make up that scene, uh, those shots together, we call that a sequence. So you will hear some people talk about this scene or this sequence. It's the same thing, but sequence refers to the shots. Scene refers to the part of the story. Uh, and then uh, the last word here is a montage. In Chinese, we call this mong tai chi. And this is where uh, the film uses a series of fast cuts to show time moving quickly. So like if you watch a sports movie and the the characters start training, right? Uh, so like the first they do this activity, then they do that activity and it moves very fast. And that's called a montage sequence. Um, uh, in, in English, it's weathering with you. Huh? No, not your name, the one after that. Yeah, did you guys see that one? That one had three montage sequences. Every time it had fast shots of trains, rain, people running, that, and like strong Japanese pop music. That's a montage sequence. OK, so that's editing. All right, I should explain why it's called montage. Sorry. Um, montage is from French. And in French, montage just means editing. By the way, France invented the movie. You guys know this, right? The movie was born in France. Um, but American filmmakers really focused on one specific kind of editing, which is putting together a number of fast cuts. So in English, montage only refers to that kind of editing. OK, so the next department is the sound department. When you shoot a movie, the film itself only has images. You have to add the sound later. So there are a few different ways you can add sound. You can record the live sound. You can recreate the sound afterwards. Or you can just add music with no sound. Um, so how do you do that? What kind of sound do you use? This is the job of the sound designer who again works with the director to figure out what each scene should sound like. If you create sounds, you would saw, you would uh, find a Foley artist. In Chinese, we call this Ni Ying Shi. It's called Foley because the person who invented this technique is named Jack Foley, so it's named after him. A Foley artist creates everyday sounds using any way that they have to. Think about this. When you watch a movie and like you hear a door close, think about that sound. In real life, how many times have you heard that sound when you close a door? Very few times. The job of a Foley artist is not to create a real sound, is to create an ideal sound. Li Xiang de Xing, 
This is the sound that you would imagine when I ask you to think of a sound, but it's not a sound you would often hear in real life. Another example. When a character wears shoes and walks across the floor. Very strong thump, thump, thump sound. But how often do you hear that sound in real life? Unless the floor is made of wood. Again, that's the job of the Foley artist. Some of these sounds you would never imagine. This is how they made that sound. Think of the Star Wars laser. Or a laser gun, right? Pew, pew, pew. How do you make that sound? The Foley artist took a metal um, slinky, Tan Huang, and they tapped the slinky with a stick, and so it echoed that kind of sound. Um, the sound of rain is also usually created by the Foley artist. Any sound that you can hear and you clearly know what that sound is, is usually created afterwards by a Foley artist. So that's recreating environment sounds, but actors uh, also have to re-record their sound. And the way they do this is using automated dialogue replacement. Um, so if you're not recording live sound, you have to recreate that sound, then the actors first they act the scene, and then after production ends, they go to a, a studio and um, the, the ADR studio will play a specific part of the movie and the actor has to say the lines and match the image. Um, so acting is not just about performing in front of a camera. You also have to be able to recreate your vocal performance later. Um, it's called automated because there's a computer involved. But I'm not quite sure exactly how uh, sophisticated the, the computer is. Um, so you guys know uh, when actors make animations, when they make cartoons, they, uh, they also like, look at the image and then they, they deliver their dialogue to match the image, right? And that's what every actor has to do if they use ADR instead of live sound. Uh, and sometimes this is really obvious. Um, did you guys see that uh, Jay Chow race car movie? Uh, it's a okay, it's a terrible movie. But what I want to say is his wife, Kun Lun, uh, plays the, the female lead in that movie, and her ADR sound is terrible. I trust that she knows how to speak, but when she went to the studio to record her a dialogue for ADR, it sounds like she's speaking into a microphone, which is not what you want. Um, so yeah, good ADR is also an important part of good filmmaking. So those are the sounds that are related to what's in the movie. Then you have music. Uh, you usually have to hire a composer to write the music. Uh, and in the movie, the music is called a score. A score actually just means like the, the written music. How does a, comp a composer write a score? There are two ways. You could either finish the images first, give it to the composer, and the composer will write music, or you could go to the composer directly, show them the script, tell them what the movie is supposed to feel like, and then the composer will work with the director and the filmmakers to create the music um, while they are making the movie. Um, we say it's a composer, but really today, most composers uh, hire Assistance, lots of assistance. It's like ghostwriting, yoding xie so. You guys know what this is? So, like when a famous author publishes six books per year, they're not writing those books themselves. They give the idea to different writers and they guide those writers to write the book. Many big film composers do the same thing. They talk with the director, they get the idea, 
they work out some basic musical themes and concepts and they give those basic ideas to their assistants and their assistants will write the actual music. Um, there are different ways to use music in film. You can show, uh, you can use it to show the characters emotions. You can also use it to manipulate the viewers emotions. Think about horror film music. That kind of music is supposed to make you feel something. It's not necessarily what the character feels. Um, and aside from background music, sometimes you want actual songs, right? If you watch like a, a Disney cartoon, they will have songs, actual songs, not just background music. Um, so the sound designer and director also have to work with musicians and ask them to write songs. And if the song fits somewhere in the movie, they can add it to that scene. If the song does not fit into the movie, they might add it at the end during the credits. Right, OK, the next person is the sound editor. So this is the person who takes all of the sounds. He the, uh, the editor looks at the images and they work with the director to figure out which sounds belong with which images. And they have to time it exactly right. Have you ever seen a movie where the sounds feel like the timing is a little bit off? Like the like you close the door and the sound of the door closing comes a little too fast or a little too slow. And that's the sound editor's fault. Um, have you guys seen Whiplash? Some of you have, right? There's a scene near the beginning where the conductor played by J.K. Simmons says that the drummer played by Miles Teller is too slow. I really love that scene, not because J.K. Simmons is slapping Miles Teller, but because before, like when he first says you're too slow, I think a lot of people wouldn't be able to tell. But when he actually starts slapping Miles Teller, the difference is quite obvious. Uh, when he when the timing is on, you can tell it's on. When it's off, you can tell whether it's too fast or too slow. So that's what the sound editor does. L locating the sounds according to the images. But location is not enough. You also need a sound mixer. The sound mixer works with the director to decide how loud each sound should be at every moment of the film. Think about this. In every scene, you have people talking, sound effects, music, and maybe you have live sound if you recorded it live. That's three or four sounds for every image. Which one should be the focus? That is the job of the sound mixer. Now, the thing about sound mixing is it's not for every scene. It's not for every shot. It's for every frame. 24 frames per second. Every frame, the sound mixer has to decide which sound should be loudest. That's why it takes a lot of time to make a movie. Um, so if you watch the Oscars, well, I guess not this year, but like in, in the past, they used to have a, an award for best sound editor and best sound mixer because these are two completely different things. And the last one is the effects department. There are two kinds of effects. Special effects are created while they are shooting the movie. They create the effect and then they shoot the effect, to capture that image. Visual effects are created after they finish shooting the movie. You have your images and then you do something to those images. Those are visual effects. Um, so let's talk about special effects or SFX, in-camera effects. You have things like so. So when you need to make it look like something is happening. You can use trick 
angles and forced perspective. You make things look bigger and you make things look smaller. You make it look like an actor is about to fall off a building when it's not actually true. You can use models. This is especially popular with space movies, submarine movies. You don't shoot an actual submarine, right? You create a toy submarine. You move it through water. Explosions. Have you ever tried to blow up a car? It doesn't look like what it looks like in the movies. Like in the movies, it looks like, you know, a car flips over, you shoot it three times and it blows up in a big ball of orange fire. That's not what actually happens. Um, have you guys seen the Hurt Locker? It's about a US Army guy who, who uh, deals with explosives in Iraq. It won Best Picture a few years ago. Anyway, that movie had very realistic explosions. Anytime a bomb went off, no fire, no smoke. All you could see was people being flung outwards because a real bomb doesn't care how good it looks. The point of a bomb is to create pressure to destroy people and things. So in a movie, the explosion is supposed to do the exact opposite. It should look good, but it doesn't hurt anybody. Um, so like, here's how to blow up a car in real life. I'm kidding. I'm not going to teach you that. Um, but the way they do it in movies is a part of the story. It's not an actual lesson in explosives and physics. So the explosions are also part of special effects. How do you create a good looking explosion that doesn't hurt people? Um, have you seen like a movie with like lots of gunshots and buildings being destroyed, that kind of thing? If they shoot on location with real buildings, then those uh, like pieces of the building that get blown away, either that part of the building was new, they built it for the movie, or they added a fake layer on top of the building that is supposed to be blown off. If it's, uh, and either way, if you have to do it twice, you have to do it three times, after each time, after each take, you have to rebuild the building. Each of those little pieces you have to put back on. So like this is why effects are their own department. It does take a lot of work. That brings us to the fourth one, stunt coordinator and stunt people. Stunts in Chinese, we call this te ji. You have to have an expert who knows what they're doing because stunts are supposed to look dangerous. So there's always a little bit of danger involved. Um, but if you get an experienced stunt coordinator, then when you do a stunt, it will be less dangerous and it will be more like dancing or more like um, physical acting. Yes, the actor has to fall and has to like touch the other actor, but nobody should get hurt. Some stunts are more dangerous than others. And for the really dangerous stunts, most movies will hire somebody to do those stunts instead of the actor. Those people are called stunt people. The reason should be obvious. You don't want your famous actor to die. But there's another reason. Movies are expensive. So a lot of the time, filmmakers have to borrow money. But if your actor dies and you can't finish the movie, you'd have to pay a shitload of money. So to solve this problem, there are companies that sell film insurance. These are called guarantees or bonds. These companies basically say, OK, you pay me a little money, and if something bad does happen and you can't finish the movie, I will pay back all of the money you owe. There's a step in between. If it looks like you can't finish your movie, the bond company can step in and take over your movie and finish the movie no matter what. Usually those movies suck, um, but at least it doesn't lose half of the budget. 
So that's another reason why um, filmmakers usually don't ask their very famous actors to do stunts. Because if the actor dies, uh, their movie will turn out really, really bad. Or not at all. Unless you're Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise does all his own stunts. There's a funny story about Tom Cruise, actually. Um, so one on him, one of his movies, uh, he wanted to do a stunt that was so dangerous that the stunt coordinator would not let him do it. So he fired him and found another stunt coordinator. OK, so those are special effects that actually happen. The other kind, visual effects, you do in post-production. Uh, these can include the opening title sequence and the end credits. The words you see on the image, somebody has to design those. Uh, another way to create visual effects is using blue screen and green screen. So like, uh, as I'm sure most of you know, you shoot the actor in front of a green screen, and then you shoot other images afterwards, and you put those images together. And the reason that they choose a green screen is because you have to tell the computer, replace all of this color, one color, with the other images. So you have to choose a color that would not normally appear. So that's either very bright green or very like bright blue. This is called compositing. Another way to create visual effects is by using rotoscoping. A rotoscope is, OK, so when they make cartoons, they have to draw lots of images right, on one layer, and then they add another layer and draw more images, and then they add another layer and draw more images. That's basically rotoscoping. So rotoscoping is like animation, but for real images, not for animated images. It's when the artist takes an image and they actually draw on top of the images. Another way is using motion capture. This is the kind that the news loves to report on. When an actor is supposed to be an animal or like a monster, right? They wear a, a green suit with lots of dots on them. And or maybe like uh, if it's a big monster, they have dots like poking out. And in post-production, they will replace these uh, dots with the actual monster. And the reason you need dots is so that you can tell the image, you can tell like the monster image which part fits to which uh, point on the actor. One movie that should have used motion capture but did not is Cats. Did you guys see Cats? I hope you didn't because it was terrible. And one reason is because the director forgot to use motion capture. I can't believe this actually happened, but the director got the actors to wear the green outfits, but he forgot to add the dots. So when in post-production, the uh, visual effects artists had to turn these actors into cats, they had the cat imagery, but they couldn't fit the images onto the actors because there were no dots to locate the images. So what they had to do is that for every frame, remember 24 frames per second, for every frame they had to draw the characters into cats. And that's why the movie almost didn't make its premiere date. Like uh, on the day, um, I'm a Taylor Swift fan, so I know all of these details. But on the day of the premiere, the the animators were still working on the images. Um, and that's because the director was an idiot. OK, and then the last one is the one I'm sure most of you know, CGI, computer generated imagery. This is stuff that's basically made from thin air. You don't need anything. All you have to do have is a computer. Um, but actually, more and more today, uh, CGI is being left behind for an even newer technology. These are called, um, I think they're called LED walls. So like, for example, when they shot Dune, Sacho, uh, a lot of the background was not CGI. 
what happened was they shot uh, either indoors or outdoors in in a, uh, an artificial environment. And instead of a green screen, what they did was they put up dozens of huge LED lights. And on those LED screens, they would create the images that were supposed to be in the background. So it's like uh, CGI in camera instead of afterwards. Um, the benefits, there are two benefits to this. First, it saves costs. You don't have to hire a bunch of people to create the images. And the second benefit is when more and more people think that CGI looks fake, LED walls look more real. It's like you're acting in front of a TV and the TV gives you the images that you need. Um, so even today, Hollywood is still advancing in terms of technology. Um, but for CGI um, itself can save costs. Think about this, which one is cheaper? You build a set, you build a background to shoot 10 minutes and then you take it apart again. Or you hire like a dozen guys to design and, and create that background. Right, the second one is much cheaper. Um, but one reason it is cheaper is because in Hollywood, every crew member is a part of a union, Gonghui. But for VFX studios, very few are. A union can set a minimum salary, a minimum wage. If the filmmakers don't, if they pay below this number, the crew members can refuse to work. But if the VFX artists are not part of a union, then whatever the filmmakers pay, as long as their own bosses accept the deal, they have to do the job. So filmmakers have often abused this power. There are many stories about how the VFX studio boss agrees to a deal, and then in the middle, the filmmakers change their mind. They want to add more details. They want to add a different scene. They create more work for the artists, but the artists don't get paid more because their pay is a part of the original deal. Um, so using the newer technology of LED walls can also help solve this kind of abusive problem. Uh, of course, the solution just means there's less work for VFX artists, so it's not like a very good solution. OK, so that's the handout. And so uh, if during the discussions of each movie, you need to talk about some parts of the filmmaking or you need to use some specific vocabulary, you can consider looking at the handout. Questions? One thing that the handout did not talk about is the writing. Right? These are all like, what are the images? How do you make the sounds? But what about the story? We'll talk about that after the break.
So we were just talking about the different parts of making a film. But why didn't we talk about the story? Isn't that one of the most important parts? Well, the reason is because writing a film script or a story comes before making the movie. Yes, during the filmmaking process, there might be rewrites. The director might rewrite some parts. The director might choose to shoot a scene different from how the script describes it. But the story itself should be there before the film starts, usually. So uh, when we talk about a film script, that has more to do with pre-production instead of production or post-production, as we were just discussing. Here's how you start making a movie. Remember, the most important part of starting to make a movie is finding the money. So you have to start with something that will convince a movie studio or a rich person that people will want to see this movie. 
you could have a famous actor, famous director. The movie itself could be about something from the news that people are interested in. Or you could just have a really good story. Um, for the first three kinds, you don't have to have a full script, but you do have to have an idea of what the story will be. And when you uh, when you present the story idea, you have to write it down. So that is called a uh, treatment. A treatment is a document recording the idea for the story. Uh, and you take your treatment or you take your script and you go to the people with money. It could be film studio, could be a production company. It could be several production companies or it could be rich people. And you say, I have this idea. Uh, we have already gotten a few famous people to sign on. Will you give us money to make the movie? And the people with money will either say yes, no, or yes, but you have to do blah, 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 blah. Usually the third answer or the, the, the most frequent answer is no. And then the next most frequent answer is you have to do this, this, this. Sometimes when you bring your idea uh, to ask the famous person whether they will jump onto the movie, the famous person will also have conditions. Yes, I will join your movie, but only if you do this, this, this. So from the very beginning, filmmaking is a collaborative process. You have somebody with the idea, with the vision, and then you have all of these other people you have to work with. And these other people will have their own ideas, will have their own schedules, will have their own needs. And the director and the producer have to work with these people and let them help to make the movie. That's the only way you can make a movie. So for a long time, this might sound crazy, but for a long time, people disagreed about whether movies can be art. Today, obviously, we think, yes, it can. But precisely because it takes so many people that to define a movie as a work of art meant redefining the role of the artist. When you write a story, you are the only writer. You may ask people for advice. You may give your story to other people and let them give suggestions, but you are the only writer. When you paint a painting, you are the only painter. But when you make a movie, you absolutely are not the only filmmaker. So counting film as the seventh art, after music, painting, sculpture, architecture, and a few others I can't remember, really changed the definition of what is art. But if you think of movies as a possible art, then that helps you answer the next question. Are video games art? More and more people are saying yes. If you can agree that movies, which take so many people, can be art, then video games, which take so many more people, should not have that problem. Of course, for every art form, there's good art and there's trash, right? Most movies, I think around 80% of every kind of art is trash. Um, like when we study literature in this department, if you take uh, introduction to Western literature, we read like what, five things, seven things? Out of 3,000 years of Western cultural history, we read seven things. Most art is trash. So just because most of the movies you see are bad, most of the games you play are bad, does not mean movies cannot be art or that video games cannot be art. But you have to remember, and even when they create an artwork that is a movie, it takes a lot of people. You have to negotiate. You have to work together. Uh, and you also have to help me. Could you please close the back door? Thank you. Teaching is also a collaboration. Um, I keep saying movies, film. Why do we call them movies? Another way to ask this, 
when you watch the Oscars and the last award is best picture, 最佳影片 best picture. Why are there so many different names? Um, so the original name in English is moving picture. Pictures that move, right? So、uh, that's why the Oscar is called best picture. That's why we call them movies. It's short for moving pictures. When they first invented movies where characters can talk, so moving from silent movies to talking pictures. So 默片到就是演员的声音听得到 They called those movies talkies. So for the same reason, we call them movies. Another name, film, refers to the actual thing that you used to shoot the images onto. Jaldrin. That's what the word film means.、Um, and then another name you might have heard is cinema. Cinema comes directly from the Greek, kinema, which means movement. So you can see that the essence of this art form is that what you see on screen moves. Okay, so、uh, I think that is the introduction to the basics of films and filmmaking. Do you have questions? Okay,、uh, I want to say a few more things.、Um, we will talk about documentary in week three, but today I want to talk about、um, animation and let's see, sexual desire. Yes. Okay. So let's talk about and and fantasy. Let's start with fantasy and science fiction, and we'll move into animation. When you take a picture, as we were saying. Most of what you see is real, but you choose whether you want to accept those things in the picture. When you create something that is fictional, like a movie, you may have ideas that come from life, but you have to create those images. You may go to a specific location, but you can change how the location looks. I know some movies where they wanted the grass to look greener. So they hired painters to paint the grass green.、Um, another common technique is when you want the background to look clearer, sharper, more romantic, you make the background wet. You spray water on everything, and everything looks much clearer. So you can change the locations that you find. This means that if your story is not based in real life, if it's a fantasy story. Or a science fiction story, you have complete freedom to do whatever the hell you want. But that's not always a good thing. Think about your English writing class. What is the scariest moment when you have to write an essay? When you're facing a blank page. For an artist to create a work, they need some guidelines. If you let them do whatever they want, it's less likely to be good. So when you watch or when you want to make a fantasy or a science fiction film, you have to set some rules for yourself. Most of those rules will come from the design of the story world. In this world, is there magic? Are there dragons? Are there only men and women? Can creatures talk? If it's in space, how advanced is the technology? Is it industrial or is it commercial, like tourism? Is there new technology like anti-gravity, faster than light travel, or is it using current technology? And if there is new technology, what are the limits of that technology? How do those limits shape the story? Affect the characters, affect、uh, the conflict, or what is going to happen next. The possibilities. If you do something that's completely fictional, you have to set some rules. And when you set rules for yourself, it's easier to break those rules. Think of your alarm clock. That's a rule you set for yourself every morning. 
Raise your hand if you always wake up when your alarm wakes you up. Nobody, me included, because it's a rule that you set for yourself. So if you set a rule for yourself, you have to make sure to stick to those rules. Uh, films that break their own rules can be very annoying. For example, any movie that ends by saying, oh, it was all a dream. No way. Any movie that says, oh, this person is from the future and we're only telling you at the end so we can solve all the problems. Doesn't work. You have to set the rules and follow them. So that's fantasy and science fiction. Even more freedom is animation. You don't even have to use real actors. In a Marvel movie, you at least have to have real actors and costumes. The background can be fake, the action can be fake, the sounds can be fake, but you have to have a real person. Not in animation. In animation, you can really do whatever you want. And so like uh, some of my favorite animations are completely surrealist, absurdist, because there are no limits. But that just brings up the question again, you have to have some limits. What are the rules that you set for yourself? Another way to think about this question is, why is this story animated instead of shot using real people? Animation and real uh, shooting are completely different. Well, not completely. They are very different kinds of filmmaking. So when you have your idea and you decide you want to use real people or you want to go the animated route, you have to ask yourself why. Usually the answer is that it is very hard to do what you want to do with real people. Uh, and in those cases, you will usually choose to do animation unless your name is James Cameron and you're making Avatar 2. Um, but another reason could be that there are some specific images or specific effects that are impossible to do even with a computer. Uh, maybe it's something to do with the human body. Maybe you want to have a fantasy character for only one scene. Sometimes none of the visual and special effects can do what you want to do. Those times, you might have to choose animation. Now, there are two kinds of animation, 2D and 3D. And it, the process for making these two is quite different. 2D animation is what I was talking about when I was talking about rotoscoping. You draw some images, you add another layer, you draw some more images, you add another layer, you draw some more images. And when you make them move, you can move the different layers at the same time to make it look like things are moving. Um, but in this case, the moving part, you have to redraw for every frame. Remember, 24 frames per second. Every frame, you have to redraw the moving parts. So um, it takes more time, um, but it gives you more control. So that's 2D animation. 3D animation is actually more like real life uh, filmmaking. The difference is that instead of using a real person, you have to first create the person in a computer. But after you have created the person and the objects and the background, um, you use a kind of physics engine to tell the computer how do these things interact. When a person touches an object, what happens? Does their hand like fit the object? Does the object bounce away? What happens? That kind of software is called a physics engine. Uh, you usually see this in video games. Um, so you have to design your people, your objects, your environment, choose a physics engine, uh, and then you put them together. And then in 3D, you have a virtual camera. You, because it's 3D, you have to pick a perspective to look at the image. And so we, when you have a virtual camera, you can also tell the camera to move, 
zoom in, zoom out, and it becomes more like real filmmaking. Um, so, forgot what I was going to say because somebody walked in. Uh, yes, so when you have a virtual camera and you're doing 3D animation, it's more like real life filmmaking. So the film scholar Lev Manovich uh, once said that the essence of filmmaking is animation. In the early days, uh, when the cameras were shitty and the images were low quality, the filmmakers would fix the images by drawing and painting on the images. Today, lots of movies fix images, add images using computer animation. So according to this scholar, everything in between is the exception. Animation is the essence of filmmaking. Uh, again, I don't exactly agree, but I think it makes a kind of sense. Even when you do animation, it has to look a little bit like real life. Otherwise, um, we can't understand what's going on. But it does give filmmakers much more freedom to do what they want to do. I remember what I was going to say. Um, a lot of 3D animated movies are created as a proof of concept in order to prove that a new technology is possible. So like Avatar 2 is a proof of concept using underwater cameras. Um, some of uh, like um, the Pixar movie Entangled, the one where the princess has really long hair. That one is a proof of concept that they can animate hair in a very detailed way. Um, or like uh, a movie you probably did not uh, that you probably chose not to see is Hotel Transylvania 3. The animation with the Dracula takes his family to go on holiday. Was a proof of concept of motion animation. They use the same design principles, right? Create a digital person, create a digital object, but they were able to move those people and objects in extremely fast and detailed ways. So even though the film itself is OK and it's not very famous, if you're an animator, then you definitely know what happened in that movie because it advanced the technology. Filmmaking technology is advancing all the time. Digital cameras are getting better. IMAX cameras are getting better. Image resolution always improving. Right, so that's animation. Uh, if you want to, your final project can be an animated film. I'm not going to stop you. But I do encourage you to keep up with your schedule. OK, do you have questions about animation or science fiction, fantasy, these kinds of things? OK, one last thing I wanted to talk about before I let you go, sexual desire in movies. Movies are a visual medium, and people have said that every image contains some aspect of desire. It has to make you want to look. Um, so it doesn't have to be actual sex. It could be somebody wearing beautiful clothing. It could be romantic lighting. It could be the way that a character loves an object, like a stuffed animal like a, a blanket. All of these are kinds of desire and they show the relationship between people and between people and objects. Sexual desire uh, we can talk about in two ways. In one way is between characters. Sex is a normal and universal part of the human experience. When uh, everybody has um, some kind of sexual related experience, it would be very fake to pretend that movie characters do not. So even in a movie where the main characters don't kiss, don't, don't fall in love, there is some kind of attraction, and we call that attraction chemistry. 
But sometimes the movie is about a sexual relationship, whether it's a romantic comedy or it's a drama. And we should remember that sexual relationships are just another kind of relationship. You have friendship, you have romantic relationships, sometimes you have abusive sexual relationships. These are all different sides of the human experience. Watching, like when you watch an action movie and you like it, it doesn't mean you want to go and kill people. Therefore, when you watch a movie about a sexual abuse, and you think it's a good movie, that does not mean you want to go out and rape people. This should be easy to understand. Um, in today's world, when visual media is the dominant form of media, the kind of stories that movies tell and TV series tell about relationships and the human experience seep into our unconscious. The kind of values of the filmmakers influence how we see the world. Whether we know or do not know that this is happening. Um, so a lot of movies today, they really have a strange attitude towards sex. Either they ignore it entirely or they think of it as something to acquire and possess as a kind of achievement. Or they think of it as unequal, abusive, uh, and traumatizing. Yes, these relationships do exist, but there are also positive and healthy sexual relationships that not many movies today show. Um, so I just wanted to uh, remind you of this fact. What we see in the movies is a reflection of life, but it's not a complete reflection. Always remember that especially today in the age of YouTube and TikTok. What you see on your phone is not all of reality. The other kind of sexual desire in movies is between the film and the viewer, you. Especially um, in the early days and in like in the 50s to I think 80s, 60s to 80s. Movies were often made for the ideal male viewer. Many movie studios today still think about men when they think about the audience. And so for a long, long time, it was hard to find a female movie star who played roles that were actual people. If you go to watch movies from the 60s to the 80s, most of the leading women on screen were supporting the man or they were seducing the man or they were making creating a dangerous situation for the man not many uh, popular movies dealt with the experience of women so you know as i said films are not a complete reflection of life today more and more films are making up for this gap but there are still some films made for what is called the male gaze, nan xing de zhu shi. And so it's important to remember this fact when we watch the movies. How complete and human are the characters that we see? Can we imagine their lives outside of the story? Is the relationship between the characters presented as normal or not normal, and why? And if the movie is trying to be sexy for the viewer, why? Is it because the viewer is supposed to be uh, in the place of one of the characters? Is it because this movie is just trying to make money? Or is the character who is being portrayed as sexy trying to communicate using their body? So like today, uh, you know, some people's reactions to, to sex in movies is like, ew, why do we have to watch this? But you should remember that that's not always the case. Sometimes sexual desire is a key part of movies. Depends on the movie. Um, and uh, this is especially important when we watch horror movies. Horror movies um, often are 
movies that focus on symbolism, Xiangzhen, or some kind of unconscious fear or desire in the human experience. Especially in the past decade, horror movies have focused on trauma, family trauma, uh, historical trauma, abusive sexual trauma, lots of trauma. Because trauma, the word trauma in Greek means a whole. Originally in, in uh, medicine, in surgery, it just means somewhere where your body has been punctured, Sichuan. So in psychology, it means some part of your mind that is not completely there. There's a part of your experience that you cannot fully understand. Usually it's related to a very serious and negative event. So when it's not something that you can fully understand, your mind sometimes comes up with symbols. And so horror movies can take those symbols and make them scary, not just to scare you, but to show you how this kind of trauma can be damaging for daily life. Um, in the past, there have also been horror movies about uh, the, the scary parts of religion, or like the scary parts of government, or the scary parts of family. Um, but horror films have always been about some kind of symbolism. Sexual desire is one kind of symbolism like that. So like in a lot of horror movies, you will you will see like the uh, victim, I guess, the people who get killed are like college girls, right? Or like uh, someone beautiful dies first. Or like the last person standing is, could, is usually also a girl. Uh, in fact, this last one has its own name. This person is called the final girl uh, in film studies. And so like when you have a movie uh, that is a horror movie that is ab about symbolism, it's more common to involve other kinds of symbols, including symbols related to sexual desire. And that's why uh, um, the famous film critic Pauline Kael has said that to really make a movie to make money, you only need two things. Kiss, kiss, bang, bang. Romance, death. Um, but that's just to make money. To make art, you need much more. OK, so uh, sorry I talked for so long today. I promise the rest of the semester will be mostly movies. Do you have questions about anything today or related to the course? OK, next week we're going to watch State in Maine, which is a very, um, I don't want to say very, but it's kind of funny. A uh, movie about pre-production, preparing to make a movie. After the movie finishes, I will walk you through the end credits and we will look at the end credits line by line to see just exactly what is being written on the screen. Week three, we will watch the French film uh, Day for Night, which is about sh actually shooting a picture and making a movie. Um, and then after we finish that movie, um, I will talk about documentary because week four, we're going to watch a documentary uh, about post-production, digital filmmaking. And then at the end of the movie during week four, I will divide you into small groups and I, I will give you the rest of that week to begin talking about your final projects. And then week five, we begin the mystery movies and group discussion. What am I forgetting? Ah, week three, it's a French movie. Um, does anyone not read Chinese subtitles? Does anyone want English subtitles also with Chinese? Yes, OK. Yes, yeah, so I have prepared English and Chinese subtitles. OK. Um, reminder. After each movie, I will upload the movie to the OneDrive folder. And I do encourage you to practice adding subtitles because you will need to know how to do that for the midterm exam. OK, that's it. See you next week.